weeks ago, I did a video on how middle-of-the-road cars progressed over the past century or more. But how well did the examples used represent the period they were from? Presumably, some better than others. So in this video, I'm going to try to pick a vehicle to represent each decade, domestic and import. Again, I'm not going for the most popular, but cars that you can't help but to think of the time period it was made once you see it. Unlike the before-mentioned video, the early years are actually quite easy. Not because there aren't a lot of vehicles to choose from, because there are, but because the choices seem kind of obvious. Take the 1890s, for example. There are a lot of early options to choose from, but the obvious choice for a domestic car is America's first car company, Durier. Not only were they first, but they had a lot of early success in a market that was dominated by European brands, such as Panhard, Renault, and Daimler, to name a few. But Durier was a relative newcomer compared to Benz, which was already world-renowned at the time, making it the obvious import brand. The early 1900s also had a lot of choices. Buick, the foundation that built GM, Cadillac, immediately establishing itself as the standard of excellence, and of course Ford. But I'm going with the Oldsmobile Type R, a car that took advantage of the assembly line early on, as well as marketing that demonstrated durability, value, and style, all helping it to set sales records for 1903, 1904, and 1905 before becoming part of GM in 1908. The import? Tougher in a period when all cars were considered a luxury. But I would have to go with the Mercedes Simplex, a car that competed in the super luxury segment with the likes of Cadillac and Rolls-Royce and built on the image of the already successful original Daimler. Now I'm sure you're asking how I could pass on the Model T as it was introduced in 1907. And the answer to that is because its dominance came in the 1910s. At the beginning of that decade, Ford was only marginally outselling Buick, but before the end of the decade, the Model T was outselling everyone else combined, on a global scale, while high-end luxury cars remained the most common imports. But Renault was not only importing cars, but selling engines to upstart American brands, making it my choice for this decade. The Model T's success carried into the 1920s, so who else to name for the 20s but the car that dethroned Ford, Chevrolet. Although not with the same level of success, it proved that popular affordable models didn't have to remain outdated or unchanged. Of course, it also created an epic automotive rivalry. And while popular domestic brands dominated the market, and Austin was making a name for itself pretty much around the world, Typically, only the wealthiest of the wealthy imported their cars, and nothing said wealthy quite like a Rolls-Royce, which had to open up a U.S. factory in 1921 to meet its three-year backlog in sales. There were so many great cars in the 1930s. Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg, Pierce Arrow, Packard, Marmon, Stutz, LaSalle, and on and on and on. But most of them failed during this period. Of course, Ford, Chevy, and now Plymouth were the dominant brands, but for this decade, I'm going with the Chrysler Airflow. Not exactly a sales success, but it changed the way cars were designed and built, and there is no question as to the era it's from, in spite of its unique styling. And in spite of overlooking all the exotic American brands, in the U.S., imports were still considered primarily exotic. Brands like Delahaye, Talbot, and Hispano Suiza, but nothing quite said exotic like a Bugatti. The 1940s are tougher. One might be tempted to pick the post-war wonder, Kaiser, possibly Lincoln's first Continental, or the very limited production, Tucker, but how can I overlook the Jeep? In a decade of war, this was the automotive innovation. The import choice is much easier, although it didn't arrive until late in the decade, the Volkswagen Beetle was the first import car to have a real impact on the U.S. market in 50 years. I really struggled with the 1950s. Fins and V8s? I liked the Studebaker Lowy Coupe for going long and low early on. Then there's the Chrysler 300 with its Hemi Head V8. And nothing out fins a Cadillac. I almost went with the 55 Corvette. 
not exactly finless, and an iconic part of the sports car revival, with the first of Chevy's legendary small block V8s. But if you ask anybody to name a 50s car, odds are the first thing that will come to mind will be the 57 Chevy. But the sports car revival was led by imports, with so many great choices. The MGTD, the Jaguar XK120, the Porsche 356, and many more. But it was Mercedes that was really taking imports to the U.S. seriously, being sold through Studebaker dealerships by the end of the decade. So if you combine a serious import effort with the sports car revival, you get the Mercedes 300 SL. The Japanese brands had started popping up after World War II, arriving in the U.S. in the late 50s. And although one might be tempted to go with the Toyopet Crown, I'm going to say the Datsun 220 pickup. One would think the 1960s would have to be a muscle car, the GTO being the obvious choice, even with all the earlier super stock models. But really, nothing can compete with the success and impact of Ford's Mustang. While well, European imports were having more influence, with cars ranging from the Citroën DS to the Ferrari GTO, but none entered American pop culture quite like the Jaguar E-Type, or XKE. Although there were still not a lot of choices coming in from Asia, and cars like Subaru's 360 were not helping America's perception of them, the introduction of the Toyota Corolla was one of the first steps in changing that. The 1970s was another hard one. So many changes and so many contradictions. Which end of the spectrum covers things best? Small or large? It needs to have a long hood and a short deck, with, of course, opera windows and a Landau top. I almost went with the Cadillac Eldorado, as it created the look and did it with 8.2 liters of V8 engine powering the front wheels. But its front-wheel drive was a bit uncommon for the time, and what with downsizing in the decade, I don't know that it really represents the 70s all that well. The Cutlass Supreme certainly does, but I opted instead to go with the Monte Carlo. Introduced in 1970, it led the way into the touring coupes that dominated the decade, and with its 1973 restyle, couldn't be any more 70s with a disco ball hanging from the rearview mirror. There were any number of European imports to choose from, the Lamborghini Countach was out, but as a pop culture poster, that was more of an 80s thing. Only Volkswagen had any noticeable market share, and the Rabbit, or Golf, would set the trend for small cars going forward. Small Japanese cars were popping up everywhere, often with American badging, but some were starting to see some success under their own branding, such as the Toyota Corolla or Mazda GLC. But it was Datsun that had the early success, and as much as I'd like to go with the 240Z, the first Japanese car aimed specifically at the U.S. market, it was the B210 that was going to save us all from the fuel crisis. It seems to me that a turbo is a must for the 80s, like a Grand National, but it should also be a hatchback, like a Mustang SVO. And front-wheel drive is an 80s thing, as well as plastic bolt-on effects which describes half of what Dodge was offering at the time. But I think the Dodge Daytona Turbo Z checks all the boxes and is about as 80s as hot pink leg warmers. The image of European brands were changing, with the Germans taking even more of the spotlight. The big Mercedes was still in the public eye, as was Porsche's 911, and Audi was getting attention with things like the Quattro. But I think the obvious choice is BMW's 3 Series. Well, small Japanese cars were gaining popularity, like the Mazda 626 and the Toyota Camry. But I think for this period, I've got to go with the Honda Accord. For the 1990s, things were once again getting bigger and badder, and starting to lean towards retro. At first, the Dodge Viper seemed like the obvious choice, but with the increasing shift towards trucks, perhaps the Hummer would be a better option. European cars for this period are hard, Porsche, BMW, Mercedes, all had a lot of interesting cars, but do any of them scream 90s? Reaching back into the realm of exotics, I've got to go with the Lamborghini Diablo. The Japanese would hit their stride in the 90s, with the Lexus, Infiniti, and Acura taking on the luxury segment, the Camry and Accord taking the sales lead, 
while teens were dreaming of Evos, WRXs, Supras, NSXs, and the 300ZX. But what could say more 90s Japan than the Integra? Well, maybe the Eclipse. The car I'm picking for the Asian import. The 2000s saw a bit of a muscle car revival. The Holden-based GTO in 2004, but it was a bit of a flop. The first of the retro Mustangs in 2005 started out a bit weak. The Challenger had a Hemi V8, but wasn't introduced until 2009, making it too late to represent the decade. So when it came to a car that was muscle and bling that everybody suddenly had to have, it was the Chrysler 300 introduced in 2005, also with the new Hemi V8. But as badass as that was for its time, if you had never heard of Bugatti before 2005, you certainly had afterwards with the introduction of the Veyron. 250 miles an hour in street legal? How could that not get your attention? As for Asian imports, the choice is once again obvious in my mind. The Prius wasn't just a new car with new technology. It was an automotive movement. It wasn't enough to have a hybrid, but you had to have that Prius badge. Of course, it wasn't long before muscle went to whole new levels, but the push for the 2010s continued towards electrics and hybrids, such as the Chevy Bolt. But why not get both with the Tesla Model S? Perhaps not the build quality you're used to, but it sure has the major manufacturers hustling to compete. As we get closer to the present, it's harder to get perspective for a period. Porsche gave us such things as the Panamera and the Macon, Jaguar the F-Type, and Alpha the Julia. But I think when we look back on this period, I'm going to have to go in the same direction I did with the American choice and pick the BMW i8. Even if it was a bit of a flop, I think it well represents the period. Well, the only real standout from Asia I can think of is the Toyota Scion Subaru 86 FRS BRZ, the revival of the affordable sport coupe. It's a bit early in this decade to pick something, but if I were to, I think it could be the new Bronco or the new Hummer. But I will have to go with the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Once you get past the fact that Ford hoard out the Mustang name to push an electric SUV with nothing in common with an actual Mustang, aside from minor styling cues, you still have a high-performance electric SUV with little real competition. And this is what we are being told the future of the automobile is. For Europe, I almost went with the Porsche Taken. But I think the Polestar 2 is a more realistic look at where things are going presuming you can actually get one. For Asia, I wanted to go with either the new Supra or the new Z car. But if we are being realistic, I think a better choice would be the top-selling RAV4, in hybrid form, of course. Did I overlook some obvious choice? What would you have picked for each decade? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching.